Good morning, church. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, the good news is I hear the television channel is back up. So we are, we are live at 8.15 on channel 1024, and this service will be broadcast Thursday night at 7 o'clock on channel 1024. So if you know somebody that's relying on that, let them know. I got, I got jumped last night at the uh, event up at the high school. Hey, why aren't you on TV anymore? I said, not our doing. They dumped the channel. We're finally getting it back. So, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, a couple quick announcements. If you noticed, out in the narthex, there are two baskets on a table. That's a mission project for Camp Wesley Woods. So, you take an egg that's got a scripture in it. The scripture is yours to keep. We want you to put a donation, loose change, extra whatever. We take folding money. We take checks. Please make them out to Christ United Methodist Church. Put in the memo, Wesley Woods Mission Project. Return the egg to the other basket. May 3rd and 4th, a work team's going to Wesley Woods for the weekend to prep the camp for the summer season. You may be able to go both days. You may only be able to go one day. You may only be able to come for a couple hours. We can use your help. All right? So consider doing that in early May. We'll keep that in front of you. We have a new opportunity coming up Thursday. Um, Jonathan's going to come tell us about it, and we have a video. So by the time the video is playing, John will materialize. Oh, there he is. Okay. Go. What would happen if the people of God started handling money God's ways? You work too hard to get to the end of your life and have nothing to show for it. This is my family's legacy that I'm talking about here. I've got to have a plan and be focused. That knowledge that you pass down to your kids, that is how you change a family tree. You change your life when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And you have that moment where you say, I've had it. I'm not going to live like this anymore. This Thursday, we are starting a nine-week journey through Financial Peace University. We're starting at 6.30 in the evening, right on the other side of that wall. And what Financial Peace University is, is a plan. A plan of how to handle God's money, God's ways. And coming to Financial Peace University does not mean that you have a money problem. It's not saying, there's something wrong with my life, we, our money is just in a complete mess, and we, we need help. By coming, you are not saying that. If, you come, if you're in that situation and you decide to come to Financial Peace University, we will be able to help you. This plan will be able to help you. But it's also designed for someone that's on the extreme other end of, of the money spectrum. Uh, someone that's like, uh, we're doing pretty good with our money. We don't really have any money problems right now. I'm jealous of you if you are, are able to say that, right? But we want to be able to do better. We think we could be doing more. We think we could be more generous. We could help more people. How do we do that? And so it's designed for if you're on that end of the spectrum or the extreme opposite end and anywhere in the middle. It's a nine-week plan. And for the first week, this, uh, this Thursday, you can come for free without committing to the class, the complete class. If you just want to find out more about what's going on, what it looks like, you can come for this Thursday, and then if you decide, yep, this is for me, we can sign you up, and we can make sure that you are able to enroll in the class. Uh, my wife, Sarah, and I will be teaching it this, starting this week on Thursday, 6.30, in Open Door Classroom, which is right on the other side of that wall. So we will see you on Thursday. Thank you, Jonathan. Hey, the note on cantata is for the singers. The orchestra is going to practice today. So be aware of that if you're part of the orchestra. Um, I noticed in here next Friday, the 15th, is Kingdom Bond Kids Club. And you know how it is. Once you've been in a system for a few weeks, you don't realize that you know stuff other people don't know. So KBKC may not translate to you. Kingdom Bond Kids Club, that's one of our children's ministries here. Um, a couple dates I want you to stick on your calendar and remember. Um, the 30th of March is a Saturday. The trustees are calling it Spring Shine. 
and we're going to blitz the inside of the church and do some heavy lifting because our custodian is part-time and can only do some of the maintenance stuff. We're going to do some heavy lifting on the 30th. Please keep that date clear in your calendar and sign up when we ask for that so we can know who all is coming. Um, we're going to do one on the outside in May, be aware, but this is inside, spring shine, March earth. March 31st is the fifth Sunday of the month. If you don't realize, we do not have Sunday school last hour or this hour, the fifth Sunday of the month. We encourage the kids to be in worship. It only happens four times a year, guys. But it gives our teachers a break and it gives the kids an opportunity to come into this space and sit through a whole worship service and go, oh, that's pretty cool. I can't wait till I get to do that all the time. Last thing I have for you before we take off and run is the tech team is looking for volunteers. You do not need to be young to be on the tech team. But we're looking for people to learn how to run sound, cameras, video projection, that kind of stuff. See Matt Wagner, if you're interested in tech team, he's looking for some new volunteers, all right? Let's stop and pray. Bless you. Father God, for the next hour, we have all the time in the world. We've come here for a variety of reasons, Father, but you have called us here by divine appointment because you desperately desire to connect with us. Lord, I pray that in the moments ahead, you would pull back the veil and show us your face. You would pour into us the grace we need for these moments and all the moments to come. Help us, Father, to set aside distraction and to focus on you. We ask all this in the name of the Christ. Amen and amen. Would you stand up and say hi to somebody around you this morning before we start? Good morning, church. Let's all stand. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love.
good father and you love us lord thank you for that love thank you that you care for us with such depth draw us even deeper into your love thank you lord thank you above all powers above all Above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all. Bye. 
be seated. The ushers are going to come and wait on us for the morning offering and the team's going to lead us in a, in a song that Jerry wrote. They're going to sing it through once and then we're going to join them. Let's pray. Father God, you have poured into our lives such blessing that we, quite honestly, Lord, fail to recognize it. By world standards, Father, we are so very well off. Lord, teach us to give to give with generosity, to give with humility, to give with laughter. Use these gifts, Father, to further your kingdom, to bring people into your kingdom, to change lives, to transform individuals. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Awesome Lord, mighty King, Oh, my lips just want to sing Of your mighty love A love you gave to me And your love has set me free I will lift your name on high I will let my spirit fly Into the heaven. I will sing to you because I love you so and I know no greater love than me that a man would lay down his life for a friend and I love I give the glory to the one who knew me even before I was born. It's you, my Lord, you, my King. Oh, my lips will always sing from the depths of the deepest part of me. I will sing to you because I love you so and I know no greater love than this that a man would lay down his life for a friend and I
Thank you, team. Thank you. So how many of you got to go to the Dave Pendleton show last night? Even the two strangers in the front got to go. So Dave and Linda are with us this morning, and we welcome them in the name of the Lord. Um, If you didn't get to go, you were about the only people in Franklin that weren't there. We had about 900 people stuffed in that auditorium. It got hot. I don't know how you managed it up front, brother. It was hot in there. But uh, we had a heck of a good time. Um, We have people that I think their sides are still hurting from laughing. Um, And I even knew some of the jokes that were coming, and I would laugh while I watched people. I thought, oh, they're laughing now. Wait till they get to the punchline. It was good. All right, grab your Bibles. Turn to Colossians, the third chapter. We've got a lengthy passage here. It's two verses long. Two verses. If you want to follow along in your pew Bible, it's page 1,679. 1,679. We're back to Colossians after a hiatus last week. Here are the two verses. Are you ready? Verses 20 and 21. Children, obey your parents in everything. For this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. All righty. The year was 1989. Oh, my bad. There we go. The year was 1989. I was two whole months out of seminary, I'd been in my first appointment, my first church, a whopping three weeks, and my son Nathan is born. What was amazing to me was that the doctors and nurses in that hospital allowed me to bring that child home without adult supervision. (laughs) What were they thinking, right? What I really, really wish they'd have sent me home with was an owner's manual, yes? Did anybody get one of those? Oh, how many needed them? All of us. We thought, man, you know, it, it, it wasn't too bad the first one. Then they like, they start moving. 
And then they start crawling and running and talking. And then they hit the terrible twos, which is followed immediately by the horrible threes. And just about the time you think there's hope on the horizon, they hit adolescence. And all bets are off. And we go, where's that manual? These two verses are very succinct. But what they begin to hint at is a much larger part of Scripture and a way of connecting parent and child that I think is really important. Now, i got to apologize up front. I'm pretty passionate about this subject. Fatherhood was a subject of my dissertation. I did probably way too much reading on it, and it, um, it gets me a little wound up. So let's begin. A, a few weeks ago, we began talking about the old self. You remember that? The old self where we need to put to death sexual sin. We need to rid ourselves of anger issues. And we talked then about how instead of that, we ought to be putting on love. That's the new self. Now, what we're going to talk about today, just like what we talked about in marriage, without Christ at the middle of this, you're going to have a hard time making this work, guys. Because you need the healing presence of the Holy Spirit if you're a child to obey your parents. You need the healing presence of the Holy Spirit if you're a parent to, ch- to, to, to parent properly. Now, all of us were children at one point, yes? We all either have earthly parents still alive and or we all have a heavenly father. So what I'm saying to children applies to all of us. You may have children. They may be little. They may be bigger. They may be adults. They may be 50 years old. Or you may not have children, but you see children around here and in your community, they need parented. I don't care how old your kids are, they need you as parents. And it's never too late, never too late to change how we parent our children and what we say to them, all right? So two weeks ago, we talked about the marriage relationship and how important it is to have that greased by love. We talked about women need to, uh, wives need to submit to your husband, which is a piece of cake when the husband loves the wife as Christ loved the church. And we decided the men had the much harder task, being willing to die for our spouse, making them the priority. Otherwise, this whole thing degenerates into subjection of women, and that's just, that's not good. So today we want to talk about this parent-child relationship and how this whole notion of love and this new self works into this parent-child relationship. So our text on the children's side is, children obey your parents and everything for this pleases the Lord. And there's a parallel text in Ephesians, Ephesians 6, 1 to 2a I have up there. It's actually Ephesians 6, 1 to 3. And this is what it says, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first command with a promise so that it may go well with you and you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. And obviously, the last verse goes with the second verse we read out of Colossians. So what are we talking about here? Children, obey your parents. This is not an occasional, a one-time. This word obey has the tone of habitual obedience. It should just be who we are, always obeying. If you notice when I read that, there's not a lot of loopholes in that. It doesn't say, obey your parents as long as they go to church five out of six Sundays. It doesn't say, obey your parents as long as they're always doing it right. It doesn't say, obey your parents only when they're in a good mood, not when they're in a bad mood. It says, Obey your parents in everything. And scripture is pretty clear. Jesus even said to the disciples, he said, listen, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. He didn't say, you know what, that Caesar guy, he's not really a follower of mine, so you really don't have to worry about this. You see, the command is to obey because there's authority over us and we're commanded to obey that authority. Children, parents, parents, God. Pretty simple. Now, in Ephesians, it talks about how this is the first commandment with a promise. In the Ten Commandments, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 5, it says, honor your mother and father. That's where it's taken from. The Hebrew word for honor is up there. It's the word kavod. Kavod means to determine how weighty or how heavy something is. 
So what's that have to do with your parents? You only have to listen if the parents are large? No, it's talking about who the parents are in your life. Your parents know stuff you don't know, literally. I don't care if you're 40. Your parents know stuff you don't know. You don't know how much you don't know. The word kavod also appears in the text in the Psalms when it says, um, the whole earth is full of God's kavod, his glory. It's saying, you know, when you consider the earth, the creation, recognize the weightiness of who created it. Give him the honor he is due. Children, consider your parents. They brought you into this world. They've been training you. They've cared for you. Honor them. Now, I get that, that some of your parents didn't do a real good job. I get that. That is not an excuse to not honor them. So I've talked before about a lady named Gail, and and Gail gives me permission to tell her story, so I do. Um, Gail was sexually assaulted at 12 years of age, and at 62, she decided to deal with it. For six and a half years, Gail and I walked through a book called Wounded Heart, one page at a time, literally. She she would read it, and, and, and we would... We would literally read it to one another one page at a time and get through this book. It took us six and a half years. Her mother was long since deceased. Um, as we started this journey, her father was still alive and sitting in the pews. Her father then passed. A, a, a couple of months after her father passed, maybe it was a year after her father passed, we got towards the back of the book and um, she hit what counselors call rage at mom, rage at dad. And it lasted for 12 months. She was seethingly angry at her parents. They didn't protect her when she was 12. They didn't teach her how to be emotionally healthy. They never checked in with her. Nothing. And she was mad. I knew we had turned a corner when Gail said to me one day, she said, Daryl, I've come to the realization I can honor my parents because, quite honestly, Daryl, they did the best they could. Given their damage, they did the best they could. Now, sometimes the best your parents can do is substandard. I get that. We honor them because they did the best they could. And then we pray that God fills in the gap. Okay? A very wise counselor gave me a task in 1994. My boys were three and five years of age. I was in the throes of a divorce. And he said, Daryl, I want you to go into your children's room every night after they're asleep. And I want you to lay your hand on them. And I want you to pray this prayer. God, bridge the gap between the parent that I am and the parent that they need me to be. I had the opportunity to share that with my son when he was about 18 or 19 Um, I don't even know how we got in the conversation. And he said, you come in and check on me after I go to sleep? I said, dude, since you were three, I've been coming into your bedroom every night. You've slept in my house. And before I go to bed, I pray over you. And this is what I pray. I hope you get that that's, there's power in that. There's a need for that. And as children even when our parents have fallen grossly short, that does not give us permission to not honor them, to not listen. So the second half of this then goes to the parents. Now, the text says fathers in both places. Fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. In Ephesians, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Uh, most commentators say this is really written to both parents, not just dads. Let me say this. Moms, your role in the life of your children is absolutely critical. Absolutely critical. I don't want to take anything away from that. But for a moment, I need to talk to dads because I am one. Dads, your role in the life of your children is critical. 
It is not enough to say it's mom's job to do the spiritual upbringing, it's mom's job to be emotional, I'll just provide. That is not an option. And when that happens, children grow up damaged. They do. Fathers need to step up and raise their children. Now, I know a lot of fathers will, will say, you know, once, once my daughter began to bloom in adolescence, I, I kind of stepped back because I, I didn't want anybody to think I had feelings for her. She's your daughter. Take her in your arms and hug the stuffing out of her. Kiss her on the cheek and remind her that in your eyes, she is your princess. She needs that. Study after study has shown that, that the role of the father in the life of the daughter will determine how soon she does drugs, alcohol, premarital sex, her self-esteem, her self-image, and her vulnerability to people who want to take her places she shouldn't go. Sorry, moms, that's on dad. Dad, you have to speak into the lives of your girls and your boys. I have a book in my office called Strong Fathers, Strong Daughters, written by Meg Meeker. She's a pediatrician, and she lines out in the first chapter all these results, like, like three-year-olds, three-year-old girls that are connected with their fathers show greater aptitude. Academically, fathers who connect with their daughters end up with daughters who are academically more sound. You, you cannot... I cannot overstate enough how important it is for fathers to be connected to their daughters. And dads, your sons need you to teach them how to be a man. Your sons do not need you to teach them how to jack up their truck, put really big tires on and hang truck nuts off the back. That's not what they need. They do not need you to show them how to bench press 350 pounds and flex in front of the mirror. They don't need that. They need authentic masculinity. They need to see a dad that cries. They need to see a dad that is sorrowful for his sin. They need to see a dad that is chasing hard after the Lord. That's what they need. That's how you teach your son to be a man. Okay? This shake it off, no blood, no foul. Walk it off, be a man. That's nonsense. It just doesn't work. It damages our kids. Okay, so what's this mean to embitter or to exacerbate? The word embitter, and, and these words are kind of used interchangeably um, by commentators or by translators, but they are two different Greek words. Embitter means to stir up or provoke. The notion is that not that it's a one-time experience that you can embitter your children by this, this one act. Again, it's habitual. It's, it's the long haul. So last week we talked about um, needing to hold tension between grace and truth. Okay? I'm going to tell you today, parents, we need to hold tension between complementing grace in our children's lives and truth where they need to change. We need balance. Some of you say, well, you know what? My parents told me everything I did wrong, and it, it gave me uh, fortitude, and it helped me to be strong. Baloney. Studies say it doesn't work. What you wind up with is a damaged child. They come out as a perfectionist. They come out as a workaholic. They come out with low self-esteem. That may have just described you, and it may be, this may be the root cause. Here's the other problem. If you hold this tension dead center... Studies have shown that children remember an insult or a, um, a correction seven times faster than they do a compliment. So if you're going to keep this in balance, you've got to go this way, guys. You've got to be heavy on the encouragement to balance out the correction. They remember the correction. And let me say this. Parents, there is never, ever, an acceptable reason for you to be swearing at your children, calling them stupid, dumb, ugly, worthless. If those words have ever escaped your mouth in the direction of your children, you need to go home and confess that to your children and apologize now. It just shouldn't happen. 
That is a surefire way to injure this child. And I talk to these people, quite honestly, when they're 40, 50, 60 years old. They show up in my office. And they can still share with me verbatim what their parents said to them. The guy I studied under at Ashland, um, Dr. Terry Wardle, told us numerous things that his father was prone to say to him. You have a brain, don't you? What kind of a statement is that to say to a child? Or saying, what do you got, manure for brains? Oh, good. You want to grind a child into the ground, do that. But don't tell them crying to me when they don't come talk to you and their life's a wreck. When it says the child will become discouraged, it literally means to break the spirit of the child. If we are all about correcting them, we literally break their will to the point where they will stop trying. And they will just give up. Sometimes that is active rebellion. Sometimes rebellion comes from other reasons, but that can be one of the reasons that kids really start to rebel because they're tired of always being wrong. They figure, look, I'm always wrong anyway. Why even try? It's a lot less energy. And I get the same result. Might as well. To exasperate means to rouse wrath. And, and the notion here is that, is that what happens is some parents just expect kids to know without ever training them. I was guilty of this when the boys were little. Sharon had to correct me. She goes, Daryl, a five-year-old, you cannot send a five-year-old to go clean his room, walk away, and expect it to be clean when you come back. That's not going to happen. you got to work with them and train them and help them. Doesn't mean you clean it up for them. But they put away a toy, you put away a toy. You know, you work with them. And it takes repeated training. Is there room for discipline? Absolutely. None of us, a very wise man said to me one day, he said, nobody likes to see you discipline your children, but they hate undisciplined children more. <laughs> yes? You've seen kids that have never been disciplined? Oh my gosh. Some of you have that person as a boss. How are they? Not good, huh? They're just, now they have power and they're still undisciplined. They're horrible to work for. There is room for discipline, appropriate discipline. But you have to teach them what you want them to do. Then you can expect things from them. So one of the problems is we frustrate our children by identifying their failures and never their successes. The other thing is we expect things we've never talked. So what are they talking about when they're talking about teaching? Well, two things. One, the normal things of life. Remember, this is written in a day where many children grew up and took over the, the vocation of the father or the mother. So, so they were trained at home how to do normal tasks, how to manage a house, how to manage finances, how to manage a family. But the other piece of this is teaching them this. We have amazing ministries here at Christ Church. The work of Jonathan Smith with our youth and the work of Amy Smith with our children. You all know they're not related, right? Okay. Jonathan's married to Sarah. Amy's married to Brad. By the way, it's Amy and Brad's anniversary today. She said, you haven't made it yet. It's not 4 o'clock. But anyway, <laughs> encourage them. They do incredible ministry. But if your children's only teaching and training comes from here, oh, you are in trouble. They need to see it modeled in you, which means you got to get into this. As parents, we need to know this book so that it just comes out of our mouth without even thinking about it. And then they see consistency. Oh, that stuff I just heard in Sunday school, I've heard my parents say that. Oh, the stuff my parents just said, I've heard that in Sunday school. See, there's consistency. Children pick up hypocrisy about that fast. If you're living not this at home, and you're bringing them here expecting them to get all this, <laughs> they see through that in a New York minute. It's not going to work. Somehow we need to, we need to find room to say, God, 
Help me to train. Help me to instruct. And in that word training is the notion of discipline. It does talk about correcting, yes. Punishment when necessary. But also helping them to understand who the Lord is and who the Lord needs to be in their life. The one thing they need to see you being is an obedient child to the Father. They need to see you honoring your parents. If your kids don't respect you, I'm wondering, are they seeing that in you? Are they modeling that in you? So I mentioned it doesn't matter how old your children are. There are 50-year-old men and women out there who are waiting desperately for their mom or their dad to say, I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad you're my kid. I pray for you regularly, and I can't wait to see what God does with the rest of your life. There are people who are working themselves to a frazzle, hoping that their parents will say that. That's what they need to hear. Folks, this is a balancing act. I I get that. It's a balancing act that, you know, children need to understand obedience and honoring. They need to be willing to, to follow what their parents ask them to do. If for no other reason, because God commands it. That's reason enough. And adults, we're still children, not just of our parents, but of our Heavenly Father. When he commands us in Scripture to do things, as Sharon has often told youth, God doesn't say no because he's trying to steal your fun. God says no because he's trying to protect you from yourself. Duh. We make a lot of dumb mistakes. That's why Scripture has to say no so much. Parents, we need to be about training and instructing, especially when it comes to following God. But we need to be careful of this tension between, yes, praising our children and and also showing them where they need to change. Now, let me also say, parents, not only do kids see hypocrisy, but they know when you're lying to them. So don't tell your daughter she's the most beautiful girl in school. Don't tell your son he's the most handsome kid in school. They know that's not true. There's always somebody prettier. There's always somebody more handsome. There's always somebody brighter. Be honest with your kids. You know what? You may not be the prettiest kid in school, handsomest kid in school, but you know what? I just, I'm so excited about you. I love when you care for other people. I love your stick to I, I love the way you, you hang in there even when it's tough. Find ways to celebrate them. If they're in sports, celebrate that. If they're in theater, celebrate that. If they're on the academic team, celebrate that. Whatever they're doing, celebrate them. Make sure you're at their events. They, they beam when that happens. Don't ever have your kid be the kid that there's no parent around for. I know, we're all busy. I get that. Carve out time for your family. If you're working so many hours you never see your family, you're working way too many hours. You're chasing the wrong idol. The bank account can wait. You need to care for your kids. You need to care for your family. Let's pray. Father God, as your children, we need to be reminded to be obedient. We need to be reminded, Lord, that we don't know everything. And that when you call us to follow you, we should just follow you. And as parents, Father, we have opportunities to speak into the lives of our children, of our adult children, of other children. Father, open our eyes that we may see the children around us. Not as hooligans, not as kids being bad, but as opportunities opportunities to speak into them a message of hope and encouragement and love that begins this process of transformation. Lord, give us grace for these tasks. 
We ask all this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me remind you that if you have a prayer card, bring it up and we'd love to put it on our prayer list. Let's stand as we sing. Great is the faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turn. Father God, we thank you and praise you that you are present every single moment of our lives. On the moments that we remember and sense you and on the moments that we're oblivious, it does not change the fact that you are there. Today, Father, we hold up these needs to you. Some are needs for healing, for peace after loss, for recovery, Father, so many of these needs are significant needs that just wear us down. Father, may your spirit come and bear some of the burden and build us up. For the concerns, Father, that remain on our hearts that we don't share, we also pray your presence and your grace we would each know that you have us in the palm of your very hand. No matter what tomorrow brings, you're still God. Thank you, Lord, for continuing to walk with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Great is thy faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness. this day 
Receive from God everything you need for he is a gracious father who is pouring out blessing on you. Go in peace and may the peace of Christ go with you. Amen.